in Texas. He graduated uh, from college. So um, he's celebrating his graduation with family, and I wanted you guys to know that. And next time you see him, just congratulate him. First one in his family to ever graduate from college. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, so he's got a, a marriage and family um, counseling degree from Liberty University, and uh, he's uh, with his family in Texas celebrating that. So that's really, really cool. So uh, praise God for that. Also, I just want to say thank you to a church that is, is more than generous. Uh, there, went, there was a care portal alert that went out this week. Family of five needing beds and frames and silverware and linens. You guys met the request in under 10 minutes. That is awesome. Um, and we partnered with another church because the needs were huge. And uh, beautiful little family that, uh, that John and I got to deliver the stuff to and just share a bit of Jesus with them. And, you know, there's people that ask us, why do we do what we do? And here's what we say, because the love of Jesus compels us to do this for you. And I want you to hang on that phrase because you're going to encounter need every day, everywhere you go. And if you just let those people know why you do what you do, because the love of Christ compels me to do this. Uh, and they get a chance to love on them and pray for them and minister to them in ways that uh, oftentimes we, we don't always get that opportunity. Or sometimes we're just kind of self-focused and we don't think of others as more important than ourselves. But you guys stepped up, provided, we delivered, and blessed them. So thank you for your, your generosity in that. And uh, one more quick thing before di- diving into the Word. Next Sunday we're doing a, a volunteer appreciation dinner. You need to let us know you're going to be there on your communication card. Write dinner and how many people to expect. Uh, Don't think we just know these things uh, through some sort of spiritual magical gift that we know you're coming. We need to get your RSVP. So everyone who volunteers at some capacity and helps out the church, uh, you're invited to barbecue dinner. We're going to have some some music. We're going to hang out and uh, have a little encouragement together next Sunday, 5 o'clock here at Sozo. Please let us know via the communication card, write dinner, and how many. I've already put 10 people for myself. Literally, I'm going to eat 10 people's worth of food, a uh, person's worth of food for myself. So, uh, Because when it comes to barbecue, that, th- there's no line there. Uh, it's Jesus and barbecue. That's the order of, uh, of priorities in my life. So, uh, so let me know you're going to be there. It's going to be a great time next Sunday. Uh, let's stop. Let's just pray and dive into the word. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for being so good to us. And just like the last song we sang, you are great. You are great and deserving of all worship, honor, and praise. Thank you for this time together today and for being a God who longs to be with us and longs to connect with us, longs to to dive into the the messiness of our lives and and remind us that there's hope and, and, and tells us that there is something to be confident in, and that is the personal work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the anchor of our souls, who is Jesus. Be glorified in this time, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Genesis 3 is where we're going to be as we continue our, our time in Genesis. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, we, uh, we like to play hide-and-seek in our house. And uh, ever since our kids were young, you know, when, when, when you have little babies, you know, hide-and-seek is holding them in your arms and kind of doing one of these things. You know, in a child's mind, they don't know you're, you're hiding behind hands, and all of a sudden you expose your face, and they're like, ah! Well, in my case, they scream and cry, but other than that... Uh, uh, hide and seek has changed over the years. Now, when someone, like, if I come home, sometimes the kids will hide. Like, dad's home, go hide. But we do it more with mommy. And especially at night, because then we turn off all the lights. And the kids are hiding, and I kind of just be like Mr. Creeper on the couch. And she turns the light on, and I'm sitting there like. <laughs> but it's funny, you guys remember Pink Panther? And remember his, uh, his little servant guy that always, what was it, Kato? Oh, awesome. Like, I'm like Kato in our house. So kids will come home from school, and I'll be hiding behind the fridge. And the other day, it was awesome. I was actually standing on top of our washer and dryer, and they had to, like, pass under my legs. They didn't know I was there. They opened the door. They walk in there. And there I was just kind of just rising above them. And they're like, Dad, you scared us. And I was like, good, mission accomplished. So, But there's a form of hide-and-seek that isn't fun. And that's when, like, maybe Dad comes home, and there's some discipline going on in the house. Have you guys ever dealt with that with kids, right? Like, the kids are not eager to greet you in those moments, right? It's like, oh, we're so-and-so. Well, you just kind of know they're in trouble, right? And now hide-and-seek takes on a whole different meaning in that context. Because now you're seeking someone who's hiding, not because this is fun time, because now there's some guilt involved. Now there's some shame involved. Now there's some fear involved. 
And, you know, when you approach those moments, you don't want to come right in like a bull in a china shop, but you want to approach the situation with grace, right? You want to invite back into relationship someone who's obviously erred or gone wrong, right? And that's what we have in Genesis. We have a hide-and-seek game going on between God and man and woman. And this is not the fun kind of hide-and-seek. This is the hide-and-seek where now there's man and woman who are guilty. They are now in shame, and now they're fearful of God. And what's amazing about this passage in Genesis is that God seeks them out. And we have this incredible, tender picture of the grace of God who says to to Adam and to Eve, I want to continue to live with you. I want to continue to have a relationship with you, even though you have rebelled against me. And that's the remarkable uh, power of this passage that we have before us this morning. Turn to Genesis 3. We remember the scene. Verse 1, the serpent arrives, this one who is, who is designed to, his, his, his intent is to deceive and to tempt, to, to lure man, woman into this trap of becoming gods themselves, and, uh, and, and they actually don't become like God because of the temptation, they actually become like the serpent who rebels against God, and, and, and it's them who made that choice, God had given them free will. To make a choice like this, and so while he created the, uh, the, the potential of this happening, man actualized that potentiality like we talked about last week. Now man's will is in bondage, and the only answer to this bondage is now to flee because of guilt and shame and fear. And we pick up the, the account in verse 7, if you have your Bibles, Genesis 7. The eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So now all of a sudden, in a matter of a few verses, they're not naked and unashamed. Now they're naked and ashamed. And the only thing they can figure out how to cover their nakedness is to find some big fig leaves and sew them together and then go hide. Look at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to man and said to him, where are you? Underline those words. Highlight those words. Circle those words. That's an important question. Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she's the one to blame. She gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God says to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman says, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Some interesting things going on here that I think all of us can identify with. And there's, there's loving confrontation that's happening here among, between God and his, his creatures, and specifically human beings, the only part of creation that's created in his image. There's a special relationship here, and something has ruined that relationship, and that is called rebellion. That is called disobedience. It is called sin, and sin now makes itself known in three ways that we're going to talk about this morning. It's guilt, it's shame, it's fear, and then there's a fourth point of good news for us to leave on because God invites us into relationship to find healing in these three areas that all of us have or are dealing with even in our own heart. Guilt, shame, fear. Three debilitating effects of sin that I want God to speak into our lives this morning because none of us are alone in this. Here's one thing I know that sin does. Sin lies to us and tells us we're the only ones dealing with this stuff. Like, coming into a church environment 
we are so often prone to listen to the whispers of sin saying, who are you to go into that environment because all those people got their lives together, you don't. What, what makes you think you deserve a, a seat there? What, what makes you think you deserve to sing those songs? What makes you think and you fill in the blank and we hear the whispers of, of guilt and shame and fear and, and that's all a device of the enemy to, to, to get us off the focus of who we are in Christ. See, this is an identity issue and identity in Christ is one of those things that we are, are, always need to focus on as, as believers because we're always going to do battle against guilt and shame and fear, but I want to raise the stakes for us this morning. I want us to, to, to deal with these topics head on, but again, the remedy is all found in Jesus Christ. Um, so this morning, let us learn that as we deal with guilt, as we deal with shame, as we deal with fear, these are really progressive manifestations of sin in our life. See, when, when God deals with the guilt... He's then able to deal with the shame. And then when you focus on the, the identity piece and, and growing out of the shame that the enemy wants to debilitate you with, you begin to live fearlessly in the presence of your God. See, guilt has to be dealt with first. Then guilt feeds us uh, truth about our identity and we don't have to be shameful. And then the fear to live in light of who God is and who we are just continues to grow and, and be bolstered in our lives. So it's important that we understand this successive order of things. Guilt, shame, fear. So the first thing we deal with is, is guilt. So here's Adam, here's Eve, man, woman. They pass from life to death. They pass from sinlessness to sin. They pass from harmony to alienation. They pass from trust to distrust in a moment of a second. All it took was for, for Eve to be led astray by these false truths that weren't focused on God and his character and his word and his will, and her husband there with her, and both of them complicit in this act of disobedience, now plunging not only themselves but the rest of humanity into this awful predicament we call sin. But praise God, he approaches us and invites us back into relationship with himself. See, we could have had an end of the Bible right there. And God would have been totally holy and just and righteous to leave man in his situation and her situation and for God to be just in, in leaving it as it was. But instead, God comes down and dwells among man and walks in the cool of the garden. Isn't that an interesting picture? Now think about this. This is an ongoing relationship God had with man and woman. This was a regular occurrence where God would stroll with man and woman in the garden, in the cool of the day, probably taking in all the things that God had created, all those things pointing to his glory and his power. He would talk with man. He would talk with woman. There was regular fellowship and connection going on. But now God comes down for the regular meeting of, of relationship, and man's not showing up to the appointment. Right? What does man do? Man, woman, hide. Why? Because now they feel guilty. Look at verse 8 again and notice the words here. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, there is guilt and there is this, and I'm going to call it the unbearable burden within their hearts hearts because notice how God asked the question not only where are you but what about the question that God asked of them that he says who told you that you were naked did anyone tell Adam or Eve they were naked no it was something that was innate within them and this is the thing that every human being in the world comes into this world knowing deep down in their conscience is that they are a violator of God's law. So you need to understand that guilt is something that every human being wrestles with. Now the question is, how do you deal with your guilt? As a matter of fact, I love what Tim Keller says in talking with a, an atheist and, and, and challenging them in their worldview of there's no God and, 
and it's all made up fairy tale type stuff, Tim Keller asked the atheist, let me ask you one question. What do you do with your guilt? If you have an atheist friend, I'd, I'd challenge you to ask them, ask them that question. Because this is something that we see in the world, these, these, these creations of religions and faiths and spiritualities and, and why people do the things they do. They do what they do because they're trying to find some way to assuage their guilt. And it is such an unbearable burden, you never feel like your guilt is dealt with because you're dealing, it, dealing with it in a manner that is not consistent with God's character or his word. And we have to understand that the, the problem of guilt has been dealt with in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because I want you to write down a word, and this word's important. The word is legal. It is a term having to do with the law. And the reason we have this unbearable burden within us as human beings is because our hearts are violators of the law of God and there's nothing you can do in your performance, in your work, in your deeds that will ever accomplish this level of perfection that God requires. He doesn't lower his standards. He is a holy God who has told us that the wages of sin is death. Why? Because all fall short of the glory of God. So now we have this guilt problem, this unbearable burden within us. And what do we do? When we feel like we can't perform and get rid of the guilt, we begin to deny the guilt. And that's what happens to man and woman, is that the guilt leads them to a season of denial. In the words of Jerry Garcia, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Amen? All right. So their responsibility to be stewards of the creation and the garden and what God had entrusted to them now turns into guilt. When we know we can't live up to the responsibility that is written in a moral code on every human conscience, we either deny or try to make up for the guilt by performing, but we're never going to achieve the performance because God demands perfection. And let me just, just be honest, all of us have already lost that battle today. So the guilt problem is something that haunts us all. Matter of fact, the government has this thing called the Conscience Fund. Has anyone ever heard of the Conscience Fund? So check this out. So early in my academic career, fourth grade, um, I did a paper on the Conscience Fund. It started in 1811 when someone had stolen from the military a blanket. And this was years before, and there was no way to deal with the guilt within, so they sent a, it sent a mere 25 cents to the U.S. government anonymously, saying, I stole a blanket in 1811. So the government gets this money and goes, what do we do with this? There, there, there's no line item to, to put it with, so they created this thing called the Conscience Fund. So for two, over 200 years, the U.S. government has had this conscience fund in operation, and people every year send money to it, oftentimes anonymously. Things as little as three cents, but one year, a few years ago, someone sent $155,000 because they had avoided paying taxes for so many years, they wrote an, a check anonymously to the government for $155,000. In 200 years, the conscience fund has collected almost $6 million. And it is a way for people to get off their chest things that they've been holding on to for a long time. See, this is just bearing witness to the reality that we all have this conscience within, this inner burden within, that we know that even sending a check to the IRS is not going to accomplish clearing away the guilt. The only way to deal with the guilt is not to avoid it, but to resolve it. Let me illustrate with a character from um, Chronicles of Narnia, a character by the name of Eustace from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. One of my favorite scenes in the entire Narnia Chronicle series, Eustace gets greedy and puts on a bracelet that he wasn't supposed to put on, and it turns him into a dragon. 
See, his greed, his, his rebellion against the word and the will of, 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 the, of the culture turned him into a dragon, and he couldn't get his skin off of himself. And he had to submit to Aslan, which is a Christ-like figure, the lion, and allow Aslan to claw the dragon's skin off him. And in a scene that only Lewis could just write so well, he said, nothing was more unbearable than the pain of feeling every claw dig deep into tearing the skin off. But the only thing that made me able to endure it was the pleasure of it coming off of me. And this is the reality of it. Eustace gives us a picture of the inability we have to deal with our guilt. But the more than ability that God has through Christ to remove the burden and take the cost, pay the legal price that we needed to pay and endures it himself. Amen? And so you must take all the guilt and you must take all the blame shifting and you must take all the denying and you must face it, uh, face it full in the face and trust God with it through Jesus Christ because it's in Jesus who himself takes the guilt on our behalf. He is the burden bearer. He is the guilt bearer. And everything in the Bible points to him making the legal case for us. This is called justification. So next to legal in your notes, write justification. Because justification means you have a legal standing now before God, not because of your righteousness, but now because of Jesus' righteousness. And when he says that your debt is now paid in full, it has nothing to do with you and entirely has everything to do with him. Amen? And this is why Colossians chapter 2 is such a powerful passage. He took our debt and he nailed it to the cross and now you are debt free. And now guilt has been taken care of. And this is why our focus is on Jesus. This is why our focus is on the cross. This is why he is the burden bearer for us. He has emancipated us. Write down Psalm 103, verse uh, 12, if you would. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he's removed our sins from us. Woo! You now stand in Christ not guilty. Because he became guilty for you. And when his words on the cross cry out, it is finished, what is finished? Atonement has been made. The price has been paid. And when Christ says it is finished, that means you no longer have any bill to pay. It's been taken care of for you. Whew. Makes you stand up a little bit straighter, doesn't it? Makes you a little bit more hopeful, doesn't it? And yet, what concerns me is when we shift into the mode of thinking that we can pay the price for our guilt when it's already been taken care of for us. This is why we need to continue to reiterate this truth. Christ is the burden bearer. Hebrews chapter 10, I look up on the screen, write these verses down, verses 14, 17, 18. For by a single offering he has perfected, notice the word, for all time, those who are being sanctified. Now, stop right here. Go back. He has perfected. Perfected is a perfect word, isn't it? Meaning it has been taken care of and it has been taken care of to a T perfectly. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So now there's a journey called sanctification. That's how we live our lives in Christ. Knowing that we are justified, we are now sanctified. But notice the foundation of it all. You're already perfected in Christ. There's nothing you can do to change your legal standing before God. Because here's what Hebrews 10 says. He has perfected for how long? All time. So this is where we become consumed with Christ and his truth and his work. He has perfected all time for those who are being sanctified, right? Verse 17 and 18, and then the writer continues. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds. How, how often? No more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Why? Because he is the ultimate, last, final offering. Quit trying to bring things to offer, thinking you're going to continue to pay for your guilt. It's already been done. 
Now you present your lives as living in, off, and living in uh, sacrifices, Romans chapter 12, in light of what he's already done on your behalf. You are now living in freedom. You have been emancipated. So now live as not slaves to unrighteousness, but now slaves of righteousness. Jesus has done it all. Jesus has taken the guilt. When you look at the cross, he is the one bearing the burden that you deserve to bear but you can never pay the price that's why the perfect spotless blameless lamb of god took the price for you have i been clear on this i'm just wondering should i continue continue (laughs) jesus has he's borne the burden this is why god steps into the cool of the garden seeks out man woman And he says, I'm going to pay the price of your debt. Because that's what sin does. Sin requires a debt to be paid to the holiness and perfection and righteousness of God. But you could never pay it on your own. That's why we feel defeated when we rely on our own works and deeds. That's why we look to another. And we hear his cry on the cross, it is finished. And so now our identity is one who has now had the price paid for you. And to live in light of that and to have that affect your identity, there's nothing like it in the world. The price has been paid. Your guilt has been taken care of. Now you stand before God, not guilty in Jesus Christ. Now, if it was only as easy as having your guilt taken care of, boy, we, we'd be good. But now this, there's this lingering thing we call shame. And I'm going to tell you, shame is the dehumanizing torment that now we have to deal with as we walk with Christ. Because the difference between guilt and shame is important to understand. Because here's the standard attempt. As we deal with shame, here's what we do. We conceal. This is why man, woman made fig leaves and covered themselves. They were trying to conceal the shame, the guilt, the sin. And I'm going to tell you, no matter how much concealment you want to put on, nothing's going to take care of the shame that we're going to experience as we walk not toward God, but away from God. This is why God walks down into the cool of the garden and seeks them out and invites them out of hiding. See, my prayer is that we would be a church community that doesn't shame one another. That doesn't that doesn't mock one another, that doesn't say hurtful things to one another, that we realize we're all works in progress and we've all got history and we've all got a story and we've all got crap we need to deal with, right? But before God and the cross of Christ, we all stand on level ground. Those who are forgiven, whose debt has been paid, who are guilt-free because of Jesus' sacrifice. Now we learn to live breaking the, the, the chains of shame. What's the difference between guilt and shame? Let me explain. Guilt is usually tied to an event, something I did, something bad. Shame is tied to a person that I am bad. It's an identity issue. See, guilt is the wound where shame is the scar. Guilt is isolated to the individual, something I feel personally. Shame is contagious. It's something that we experience in community. And no one can share in your guilt, but many people can share in your shame. So when you violate God's law, you feel guilt. But that emotion is quickly and nearly simultaneously joined by shame. Shame is this this evil partner of guilt that just wants to keep you down even though you've been set free. And so what we have to understand is that when when guilt begins, shame is sure to finish. It is the thing that haunts us after we deal with guilt, and yet we must confront both our guilt and shame with the gospel of grace. Someone once said, shame is that sense of unease with yourself at the heart of your being. It's that thing that blocks your view of your new identity in Christ. It's the very thing that Jesus came and spoke against, reminding of, reminding of who you are before God. And I want you to know that it's, it, it's helpful when we are able to live together in this communal way as a family 
because shame has a communal language. So even though the Old Testament, you know, they dealt with guilt through all the offerings and sacrifices, there was a way that they shamed people that Christ did away with. It was called the city gates. Whenever you did something wrong, whenever you did something awful, you were forced to sit at the city gates. So now you walk by the city gates, and there's Doug. Doug's at the city gates. Like, what did Doug do? Like, oh, shame on you. Like, I'm glad we don't have city gates today. You know, there's Tim at the city gates. Yeah, he was there last week too, remember? (laughs) That guy's a train wreck, right? You know, like, thank God he did away with the city gates, right? Because those are those places of shame where as a community you walk by a man or a woman and you're questioning, like, what did they do? As if you got all your stuff together. As if all your life is perfect, right? And yet we bring the city gates mentality into the church. We bring it into our lives as if, you know, you're, you're like the modern day Pharisee who have life all together and you're just so quick to pass judgment at someone else's sin. That's no way for a gospel community to flourish. We don't sit here and poke fun or mock or scold people because of the sin. We sit there as those who are living in community to say, what is your identity in Christ? And let's live better for his glory. Amen. So yesterday I'm, walk, I'm watching soccer with my son. So did anyone catch the, the uh, European League final? That's what I thought. Okay, so you Americans need to get a little bit more cultured, okay? One of the greatest games and one of the greatest goals in all of soccer final history happened yesterday. So this guy named Gareth Bale, who is Welsh, which is my ancestors, go Wells. Uh, he did this bicycle kick. Shot. He had come in as a substitution, second half of the game. He's in for two minutes, gets a kick, boom, bicycle kick into the goal. Right? That was amazing. So, no, you can, yeah. You want me to demonstrate for you? Hold on, let me, let me stretch a little bit. Okay, no. Um, but what you missed, and actually what was the bigger story perhaps from the soccer game yesterday, was that the Liverpool goalie made two mistakes that are going to haunt him for a long time. The first goal came when the goalie tried to roll a ball to one of his players, and the opposing player just stuck his foot out, blocked the roll, and it went into the goal. This is a, this is a finals-level tournament. This is on the world stage. They're p- playing for the championship. And this guy had his hands in his head in his hands, and you could just you're just feeling for this guy. Right? You're you're rolling the ball to your player, and the guy sticks a foot out and scores a goal. And then later on in the game, the same goalie misses a shot, bounces off his hands into the goal. So Real Madrid ended up winning three to one that game. But what's amazing is now how the social media world lit up after the game. And the number one topic was the goalie for Liverpool. As if he's not only battling this shame and disgrace within, now he's got to contend with reporters and being interviewed, his team, the other team, and what's going on in the social media realm. Let me just tell you what is notable was that after the game, how many of the opposing team came over and hugged the goalie. But perhaps what's more notable is not one member from his own team went over to console him. And this is a team that has the motto, ready for this? You will never walk alone. And I sit there and go, boy, how does that happen on a a church level? We who are called the community of Jesus' people. We who are called the church, and the church is not a building, the church is not an institution, the church is the organic community and people of God. And how when someone messes up, we're not quick to go be with them and encourage them, we're quick to label, we're quick to judge, we're quick to condemn, and you want to know why we do that? Because we know we got crap going on in our hearts, but it makes us feel better to point at someone else's issues. That's what Pharisees do. And I sit there and go, God, don't create a culture of Pharisees. Help us to remember that we are not in this alone, and yet when you feel shame, you feel isolated, and the very thing the church needs to do is come alongside each other. 
That doesn't mean that there's not loving correction involved in those things and loving encouragement and admonition, but it means that we are together in this because we're all works in progress. Amen? I've been in part of cultures, church cultures, where, boy, if you didn't have your stuff together, good luck. I I hope it works out for you. And those are not environments you want to be. Those are not environments Christ creates. He creates environments where people who are dealing with those demons of shame can find love and acceptance and value and significance. Why? Because they're human. And the moment you expect something from somebody that you can't even do yourself is the moment that that Christ spirit is gone. Boy, I tell you, I had to deal with this personally. Because growing up in, in certain church cultures, you, you feel like you can't show weakness, you can't admit those struggles, and that you've got to always perform, perform, perform. Well, it eventually came to, to, to a season in my life where God just kind of stripped it all away. And he had to show me that who I was as his child, living among not only other church folks, but even other pastors and church leaders, that I had to just learn to be honest with who I was. And, and I've learned, and it's been a tough road, and it's been a tough, tough lesson to learn, but I tell you what, it's more freeing when I'm able just to be myself. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean my life's all together. See, pastor doesn't equate with perfection, just so you guys know. Some of you are going, amen, we know that, Pastor Scott. You know, our experience with you has proven that, right? I, I am a, I'm a human being as long as you, I, as well as you. I'm fallible as well as you are. I have my weaknesses as well as you do. I have my struggles as well as you do. We are in this together. I just happen to be kind of leading the, the team, right? I'm kind of like the team captain who's saying, okay, this is what I think God wants us to hear. This is what I think God wants us to know. This is where I think God wants us to go. And you guys are part of the journey. But never, never put me up on a pedestal, please. Never put my wife up on a pedestal. Never put my kids up on a pedestal. But may this be an environment where we can live out our struggles and our weaknesses together. And it's okay. And I've learned to be more confident in my own skin simply because it is Christ who now lives in me and lives through me. And the guilt has been taken care of, right? Point number one. And now, because he knows me as I am, where I am, and he knows that my sin has been paid for, I can be more free and open because of that gift of grace he showed me in the cross of Christ. Amen? And now I don't have to be shameful when it comes to my sin. And now I'm more forthright with sharing those things. I can laugh at myself. I can invite you into the journey, into the struggle. Because I don't want this to be a, a place where, you know, sometimes the church can be more like a country club when it needs to be more like a hospital. You know, you, have you ever been to a country club? I remember the first time playing golf. I didn't know how to dress, how to act. I mean, I'm talking during someone's putting, and you just don't do that. I'm wearing cut-off denim shorts. That's never allowed on a golf course, you know? You got no secret handshakes. It's like, hey, welcome to the club. You got to shake hands like that, you know? And it's like, well, okay, that's weird. When in reality, this is a hospital, and each of us come in this morning with some sort of stuff we're struggling with. And if there's not an opportunity for us to breathe hope and encouragement and Christ into your life, then we have failed you. We are not here to judge. We are not here to condemn. We are here to walk with you together and to, for you not to hear the voice of shame, but for you to hear the voice of hope and healing that comes through Jesus Christ. There is no place for shame. We all have a track record. We all have a story. And so what we realize is that you know, the, the shame comes, it's like a two-pronged thing. Write these two words down in your notes if you would. Shame is either um, failure-based or it's either pride-based. And, and I'm, I think you're going to find yourself in one of these two, two things. Number one, the, the, the failure-based thing is that we need to understand we are weak creatures apart from God. You try to do anything apart from God, you will fail. It's a 100% failure rate. Why? Because we fail morally. We sin. We fail due to our limitations and our weaknesses. We fail because the creation is subject to futility and doesn't work right. This is the testimony of Paul in Romans chapter 8. Creation groans. We groan, right? 
And so there's this failure-based shame that we have to realize that, yeah, you're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. And yet, on the other side of the spectrum, there's this pride-based shame that we can fail to live up to other people's expectations. And because we fail to live up to other people's expectations, we begin to be full of sinful pride, and we're ashamed of our failures or weaknesses, so we will go to almost any length to conceal our shortcomings. We will try to hide from others, and we'll put our best foot forward. We'll show them our best face, which is really a facade. And we walk away going, wow, that person has it all together when inside they are being torn up because they know they're not that. And so God invites us out of both those realms of soul-destroying shame and says, here's the narrative, look to Christ who himself took the shame upon himself. He became disgraced so that we could know his grace. The crucifixion, the cross, was an object of shame. And yet Hebrews 12 says he despised the shame. He entered into it. He despised it. He went through it. And yet why? Because for us, he earned the crown for us who did not deserve the crown of glory. He despised the shame for the glory that was on the opposite side of that. And so now it is our association with Christ that gives us honor no more shame-based relationship with god or with each other you are now a child of his and you'll be given a designation of honor and this is fantastic isaiah chapter 54 write down a few of these verses says this fear not for you will not be ashamed be not confounded for you will not be disgraced for you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more for your maker is your husband the lord of hosts is his name and the holy one of israel is your redeemer the god of the whole earth he is called amen for hosea i mean isaiah and hosea too we don't want to leave that prophet out but think about the words right we just talked about this Gone is shame, gone is reproach, gone is disgrace. Why? For the maker, your maker is your husband. He says, I want to be married to you forever. And God is committed to us forever. Consider the words of Romans chapter 10. Paul says these words. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved here is the ticket it's jesus who became a reproach for us who was disgraced for us who took the shame for us romans chapter 5 verse 5 and hope does not put us to shame because god's love has been poured out into our hearts through the holy spirit who has been given to us The fact that God loves you eradicates shame. Because no one knows you more intimately than God, and yet he accepts you? Are you kidding me? And because of his acceptance of us, even in our shameful condition, sinful condition, he still sets his love upon us, and that is hopeful. Because you don't know me, but God does. And he still accepts me in Christ. God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And so here's the message for us to hear loud and clear this morning. We counter the voice of shame with the gospel reminder that we are whole, that we are new, that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are adopted, and now nothing, nothing, no thing can separate us from the love of God found in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. I don't care who you are and what you're going to say, you can't shame me because the voice of the Spirit tells me I'm loved. I'm accepted. And damn you if you want to say something else contrary to that because I am a child of his. That's truth. And you have to treat it that way. 
because we give in to the whispers of shame so, so easily. You need to surround yourself with truth. And it's not the truth that comes from your heart, it's the truth that comes from the mouth of God that has been given to you to continue to set you free. Shame makes us hide. And the problem is when we listen to shame, we hide in all the wrong places. You need to find your refuge in Christ. Psalm chapter 17, verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. This is what the psalmist says. There is only one place to hide, one place to seek protection, one place that's called our refuge, and that is Jesus. And he says we don't have to live with secret hurts and secret shame that we can live out in the open before him because he knows all and he still loves us. This is why you find in the Gospels a woman who had been married five times, now sleeping with a guy she's not even married to, and she, he tells her, Jesus tells her, her entire life story. And no one's ever spoken to her with such clarity as far as knowing what's going on, but still loves her and accepts her. And that's why she goes off rejoicing because she goes, I met someone who tells me, who told me everything about my life and still loves me. And she tells the whole town this. I mean, she's the, she's the village floozy, all right, right? This is her. And yet Jesus loves her and now the shame's been taken away because he knows her through and through and still loves her. This is why the woman that has the vaginal hemorrhage, the bleeding going on, who's ashamed among her community, touches the hem of his garment and she seeks him out because she knows that everyone else around her can shame her, but there's one that's not going to because she knows his teaching, she's heard his words. And she touches him and he, find, he heals her and sure, she is saved and she finds wholeness. And this is why the woman caught in the act of adultery, John chapter 8, pulled from the bed of her lover, sits there half naked, ready to be pelted with stones by self-righteous people, and they all drop their rocks because there's no one there who has no sin, who has any right to damn her, condemn her, kill her, and now it's just her and Jesus, and he says to her, where are those who are going to condemn you? She says, they're not here, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, i.e., live in your new identity. This is why Peter who does this royal mess up, he's the king of royal mess ups, right? Says things at the wrong time, does things at the worst possible time, denies Jesus three times. Is he out? Is he gone? Is he done? No. Jesus, God bless you. He, he rises from the dead. He says to the women at the grave, the tomb, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Let him know that he does not need to live in shame. And even though he has messed up royally and he's my kid, I'm still going to use him. Tell him I'm alive. And you have these stories, these accounts of men and women who the culture would love to just rail on them. Who have found their liberation in Christ. Because big deal what the world says to you. Big deal what your own heart says to you. Listen to what God says to you. You have been set free, so that means you're free indeed. Live in that liberty. You've been emancipated. Live as one who has been touched by the love of Christ, who knows you thoroughly, who knows you intimately, and who he's going to accept you for all you are, all the, all the mistakes and all the failures and all the sin. Then live in the reality that he still chooses to love you. That's what we need, you guys. Quit being jerks towards each other. Christians are notorious for shooting their wounded. Stop! Because once you are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. But there's not going to be any rocks here because if we're all honest before the cross, we all have issues we need to deal with. And we can do it together with God's help and the spirit within. We can do it together. Romans 8. I mean, come on. Can we, we can't get away from this. I think I quote this verse every single Sunday. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? No condemnation. So stop. Stop doing it to others and stop doing it to yourself. There was this show called Mad TV. They were trying to compete with Saturday Night Live and didn't do too well, but there's an episode with Bob Newhart. And I don't know if you know Bob Newhart and, and his dry comedy. Dry, I love him. He was a counselor. And I don't know if you've ever, YouTube, Bob Newhart, stop it. Just write, 
so a woman came in needing counseling. And he said, listen, it's only going to take a few minutes. She's like, really? He's like, yeah, just a few minutes. I've got two words for you. She gets out her pen and paper. And he's like, you don't even need to write this down. And she's talking about the situation she finds herself in. She feels like she's always going to die no matter what. And he says, here's my counsel to you. Stop it. She's like, what? He's like, stop it. Stop thinking these things. Stop listening to your heart. Listen to your mind, right? And I want to say to Christians so often, just stop it. You are choosing to live in the prison of your own shame. When the prison doors open, you're allowed freedom, and yet you still want to remain in that prison? Live in the reality of your new identity in Christ and stop it. I could probably make a lot of money doing that, writing some bestsellers, seeking people out, them seeking me out. But isn't that what God says to us? Start living in your identity in Christ and stop living in who you were in your B.C. days. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ. Go back, we're not done yet. Thank you. From the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. He doesn't condemn us. He condemns the sin which keeps us down. And if we continue to live with guilt and shame, we bring disgrace upon the cross because the cross is the very instrument God has designed to set us free. Quit living in denial of this reality and walk in the newness of life of who you are in community with each other. And if you have a church that condemns you, find another church. And if you have a church that shames you, find another church. But I want to create a culture here where we are not into shame and condemnation and guilt. We are into focusing on the cross and the gospel life that God has for us in Jesus. Amen? Last point. Fear, the inescapable chase. So we have the topic of guilt, the issue of guilt, the unbearable burden dealt with. So we are now legally set free from the bondage, from the chains of of what we could never do, but Christ does for us. Now we are set on a trajectory to live with this new identity, yet shame comes in and tries to whisper and try to destroy us. And we need to not listen to our hearts and shame. We need to listen to the voice of God and his truth. And the more you live in these realities, the more fearless you will be. There's two types of fear. There's the fear of God and there's the fear of everything else. See, it is healthy to walk in the fear of God. It is healthy to have a sense of awe on who He is, reverence for who He is. We fear God, and Proverbs chapter 1 says, fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. But the problem is when you fear everything else that it becomes debilitating. And the fear of not being honest and open before God, this is why man ran. See, there's this inescapable chase that you are called not to run from God, you're called to run to God. Did God know where Adam was? I mean, think about the question, where are you? My theology says God is sovereign. God is all-knowing. God is everywhere present at all times. So it's obvious that God knew exactly where Adam was, but the question was one of an invitation. It was one that was demonstrating grace, an invitation back into relationship. And so the tendency with fear is to escape, when in reality the Bible calls us to face it head on. Because fear of everything else makes you irrational and unable to think wisely about things. This is why man grabbed fig leaves, as if fig leaves are, is going to cover your guilt and shame. But when, we, when we're guilty and we're shameful, we do stupid things, don't we? And so God comes and his approach is so gracious. Notice he doesn't come to damn, but he comes to draw. He doesn't come to condemn, but he comes to show compassion. He doesn't come to kill, but he comes to show kindness. 
Why? Because the answer is always running to God. And plus, here's the question that Psalm 139 raises. Where can you hide if you're not hiding in God? Where can you run to? Psalm 139 says, if I go to the highest heights of heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, you're there. Uh, When I rise, you're there. You know when I rise, you know when I go to... Like the psalmist just realizes that where can I go to flee from your presence? And the answer is nowhere. Look where it got Jonah. (laughs) Amen? Right? You can't run from God. And so the invitation is to trust him, to live in continual awe of how big and how great and how mighty he is. Isaiah 41, check out these verses. Probably familiar words. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand notice who's doing the work on our behalf it's god this is where we are in awe and in reverence of him because he's a god who does for us what we can never do for ourselves and yet the promise rings true in isaiah's day and our day that he is ours we are his and there's nothing that will ever change that relationship what do you have to fear when it comes to anything in this world nothing Live in the fear of how awesome God is, and you'll be good. Tim Keller says this, The gospel destroys pride because it tells us we are so lost that Jesus had to die for us. And it also destroys fearfulness because it tells us that nothing we can do will exhaust his love for us. Amen. So here's the remedy for fearing things in your world. Fearing Death, fearing your health, fearing your job, fearing your boss, fearing your neighbor, fearing your kids, fearing your anxieties, fearing your insecurities, fearing your temptations, fearing your, your enticements. Whatever it is, here's the answer. Live in awe of him. Let God be big and everything else be small. Because you're not designed to make God small and make everything else big. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, whoever fears the Lord has a strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. Psalm, Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life and he who has it rests satisfied. I read from a different verse, I'm sorry, different version. Psalm 112, read this one up on the screen with me if you would. Praise the Lord, bless the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Where is our answer? His commandments. Where is our refuge? His truth. Where is our security? His will. That's what these things are saying. And we do not avail ourselves to living in awe of Him. Why? Because we do not spend time with Him. We run from Him instead of running to Him. John 14, 27. Write this down. Bonus verse. This is not up on the screen. Jesus says these words. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why? Because he gives a peace that is unlike the peace that the world gives, and it's a peace that is rooted in who he is as a person because he is the prince of peace. What do you have to fear? What are you worried about? Here's my remedy. Here's my prescription as the doctor of your soul right now. Matthew chapter 6. Take two Matthew 6's and call me in the morning. See how you're doing tomorrow. Matthew 6. The chapter that God has given to us to remind us of how big he is and how trivial, not unimportant, but how trivial our issues are in light of how big he is. Because this is the passage that says, don't worry about tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow's got enough issues of its own. Be focused on today. Because God's big enough to care for the birds. He's big enough to care for the lilies of the field. How much more will God take care of you who are his child created in his image? We have nothing to fear. Our God has got this. So live in light of who he is. So let me close with this. Just some good words of, of encouragement to you. Freedom. Freedom, the gospel 
gift. And what is the gospel gift? His name is Jesus. And Jesus gives us three things that are wonderful reminders for our daily journey. Number one, Jesus is our covering. Number two, Jesus is our acceptance. And number three, Jesus is our cleansing. Number one, his covering. The Bible says, because of guilt, we are condemned because we can never measure up to the law's demand. But Christ gives us his righteousness, and the Bible pictures it this way. You've been given a robe of righteousness, and when you're covered in the robe of righteousness from Jesus, you're walking around like James Brown in a lot, on, a hot, on a hot summer night in a, at the Apollo Theater. You know what I'm saying? It's like, here he is, like, I got the robe of righteousness on, man. I'm feeling good. Why? Not because of anything I've done, but because of what he's given to me. He's got that robe of righteousness over you. He is your covering, and when you're covered with his robe of righteousness, God sees that clothing, and he no longer sees your past, and he no longer sees your sin, and he no longer sees your failures. He sees you as one who is now perfect in Christ. Amen? So you've been given a covering. Number two, you've been, you've been given acceptance. The fact that of the matter is this that we are no longer enemies you are now accepted and jesus calls us friends are you kidding me john chapter 15 i no longer call you enemies you are now my friends and just to hear him say that to us because we are now robed in royalty and righteousness we are his friends and he doesn't condemn us Quit condemning yourselves and remember you're a friend of Jesus's. And so that is a truth that we need to continue to wash over our hearts and our minds. And lastly, that he is your cleansing. And we need cleansing. And this is not full body cleansing like Peter wanted at the Last Supper. But this is just sometimes daily. We walk through the muck and mire of this world and we get dirty. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, we will find that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us of sin. See, we, we are not perfect. We will mess up. We will get our feet dirty. And praise God, we have a high priest that we can go to who makes intercession for us day and night, who is our mediator day and night, and we go to him for cleansing, not for forgiveness from sins. We've already been given that in a judicial way. Now we just do it in a relational way. And those three things, I tell you what, if you continue to grow in these truths, Christ is your covering, Christ is your acceptance, Christ is your cleansing, I tell you what, you're on a trajectory of living a God-honoring, full life in Christ. And he will empower you to live that life. And can we help one another live that life? Can we do this? Yeah. Why? Because this is not a country club, you guys. This is a hospital that's masquerading as a coffee shop. I know it's weird, but that's the truth. We are here for you. You are here for us. So can I invite us into living honestly and openly with each other with no condemnation, only compassionate with an eye towards what God wants to do in and through us? How's that sound? Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, it is because you know what? The world's not going to offer that sort of fellowship. But we can as the body of Christ. Let's live to that end. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, we need to be reminded of these things today. We need to be reminded of how central the person and work of Christ needs to be. We think we can live our lives without focusing on, on the work of Jesus. We think we can be empowered and strengthened without focusing on the gospel of Jesus. And yet you've reminded us of the centrality of that today. Lord, that in Christ, there is no more guilty burden. In Christ, there is no sin and shame that is debilitating our identity and per, per, blinding us to who we are in him. And we have nothing to fear because you, God, have reached down to love us, to demonstrate your love toward us. And now we can walk in freedom. Help us to be in step and in tune with the Spirit. Help us to focus on Jesus. Help us to focus on your greatness, God. And let us do away with the wisdom of the world and let us cling to the wisdom that has come from your very own mouth. 
your truth, your word. May we be saturated with it and by it forever and ever. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. It is truly a gift of grace. And we want to live in light of that love and that mercy and that kindness forever and ever. Give us the strength to do it. Give us the wisdom to do it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great holiday weekend. Be safe. We'll see you guys soon, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.